Mary Slusser of Calabar, Pioneer Missionary by W.P. Livingston. Chapter 24 Maiden Mother and Angel Child. Of all the tasks to which she put her hand, the sweetest as well as the saddest was the care of the babes of the bush. Her house was the refuge of little children sickly ones that were left with her to nurse and return, discarded ones that were taken to her, outcast ones that she rescued from injury and death. So many came, received names, were described in her letters, and then passed out of sight, that her friends in Scotland were unable to keep abreast of her efforts in this direction. They arrived in all stages of sickness, but usually the last. With many a broken body she had never a chance. But with marvelous patience and tenderness, she washed them, and nursed them, and loved them, and fought the dark shadow that was ever ready to hover over the tiny forms. Night after night she would sit and watch a face that was wasted and twisted with pain, or walk to and fro, crooning statues of song to soothe the restless might in her arms. Sometimes a hammock was slung up beside her, into which they were placed, so that if they awoke during the night she could touch it with her foot and swing them to sleep again. More than once, when the supply of condensed milk ran out, she strapped her latest baby to her body and tramped the long miles to Creektown through the bush and returned next day with the child in the tents. The children that were brought back to health and strength and restored to their parents, it was always a pang to part with. She wished that she could have kept them and trained them up away from the degraded influences of their homes. Those who died, she dressed and placed among flowers in a box, held a service over them, and buried them in a little cemetery, which by and by became full of tiny graves. She mourned over them as if they had been blood of her blood. Mr. Ovens used to say to her, Never mind, lassie, you get plenty more. And indeed, there were always plenty. Of all the African children that passed through her hands, none endeared itself so much to her as Susie, her first Okoyang twin. The mother, Ai, was a slave from Bindi, light in color and handsome, and was the property of one of the big women, who treated her with kindness and consideration. When the twins arrived, all was changed. Miss Kingsley, who arrived at Ekinj the same day on a visit to Mary, thus describes the scene. She was subjected to torrents of abuse. All her things were torn from her. Her English china basins, possessions she valued most highly, were smashed. Her clothes were torn, and she was driven out as an unclean thing. Had it not been for the fear of incurring at Miss Slusser's anger, she would at this point have been killed with her children, and the bodies thrown into the bush. As it was, she was hounded out of the village. The rest of her possessions were jammed into an empty gin case and cast to her. No one would touch her, as they might not touch to kill. Miss Slusser had heard of the twins' arrival and had started off, barefooted and bareheaded. At that pace, she came down to a bush path. By the time she had gone four miles, she met the procession the woman coming to her, and all the rest of the village yelling and howling behind her. On the top of her head was the gin case, into which the children had been stuffed, and on the top of them the woman's big brass skillet, and on top of that her two market calabashes. Needless to say, on arriving, Miss Slusser took charge of affairs, relieving the unfortunate, weak, staggering woman from her load, and carrying it herself. For no one else would touch it or anything belonging to those awful twin things, and they started back together to Miss Lesser's house in the forest clearing, saved by that tact which, coupled with her courage, has given Miss Lesser an influence and power among the people, unmatched in its way by that of other white. She did not take the twins and their mother down the village path to her own house, for though, had she done so, the people of Okoyang would not have prevented her. Yet so polluted would the path have been, and so dangerous to pass down, that they would have been compelled to cut another. No light task in that bit of forest, I assure you. So Miss Slusser stood waiting in the broiling sun, in the hot season's height, while the path was being cut to enable her just to get through to her own grounds. The natives worked away hard, knowing that it saved the polluting of a long stretch of market road, and when it was finished, Miss Slusser went to her own house by it, and attended with all the kindness, promptness, and skill to the women and children. I arrived in the middle of this affair for my first meeting with Miss Slusser, and things at Okoyang were rather crowded one way and another that afternoon. All the attention of the children wanted, the boy, for there was a boy and a girl, was bearing for the people who had crammed them into the box, had utterly smashed the child's head. The other child was alive, and is still a member of that household of rescued children, 
all of whom owe their lives to Miss Lesser. The natives would not touch it, and only approached it after many days, and then only when it was held by Miss Lesser or me. If either of us wanted to do or get something, we handed over the bundle to one of the house children to hold. There was a stampede of men and women off the veranda, out of the yard, and over the fence. If need be, that was exceeding comic, but most convincing as to the reality of the terror and horror in which they held the thing. Even his own mother could not be trusted with the child. She would have killed it. She never betrayed the slightest desire to have it with her, and after a few days nursing and feeding, up she was, anxious to go back to her mistress, who, being an enlightened woman, was willing to take her. She came without the child. The woman's own lamentations were pathetic. She would sit for hours singing, or rather mourning, over a kind of dirge of herself. Yesterday I was a woman. Now I am a whore, a thing all the people run from. Yesterday they would eat with me. Now they spit on me. Yesterday they would talk to me with sweet mouth. Now they greet me only with curses. They have smashed my basin. They have torn my clothes. So on and so on. There was no complaint against the people for doing these things, only a bitter sense of injury against some superhuman power that had sent this withering curse of twins down on her. The surviving infant, Susie, was not commonplace in feature like other children. She was fair, shapely, and clean-skinned, with a nose like a white child's and a sweet mouth, a mouth which Miss Kingsley called the buttonhole. Everyone loved her, and she was queen of the household. When she was fourteen months old, Miss Slessor one day went to the dispensary and left her in charge of Mana, who put down a jug of boiling water on the floor beside her. Susie thought it a plaything and seized it, pulled it over upon herself. Instead of calling for Ma, Mana ran with the child to the bathroom and poured cold water over the wounds. For thirteen days and nights she was never out of Mary's hands. Fortunately, Miss Murray, a lady agent who, at her own request, had been stationed at Okoyong for a time, and whose companionship she valued, helped her greatly. She was like a sister to me, she wrote. Thinking more might be done by a medical man, she started off with the child in her arms, arrived at Creektown at midnight, and woke up the doctor, who, however, said he could not do more than she had done. She returned at once to Ekenge, and began watching the suffering baby day and night. In the darkness and silence, when all were asleep, she would hear the faint words, Mimi, Mimi, the child's name for her, and the wee hand would be held up for her to kiss. Early one Sunday morning, she passed away in her arms. Roped in a pinafore, with her beads and a sash, and a flower in her hand, she looked like an angel baby. The event caused a strange stir in Okoyang. None of the villagers went to their fields or markets while the child was hovering on the brink of death, and when she passed away, they came and mourned with Ma. She was buried in the cemetery, where so many other hapless waifs were already at rest. In her anguish, Mary could not conduct the service, but sat at the window and looked out, while Miss Murray bravely took her place. The people, respectful and sad, gathered round the grave, the grave of a twin, and one of the women, a leader in heathenism, praised the white mother's God for the child, and prayed that they might all have her hope in the beyond. Surely was Mary's comment, they all felt the vast difference between their burials with all their drink and madness, and ours so full of quiet hope and expectant faith. The slave mother had often come to visit her, and had actually got to love the child. And when it died, she was heartbroken. Ma, she said, don't cry. I have done this. God hates me. I should go away and not bring any more evil on you. With that, she went back to her hut in the bush. If I were a wealthy woman, said Ma, I would buy her, but I cannot afford it so we must do our best to cheer her up. Although she objected to buying slave women, even to restore them to freedom, on account of the wrong impression it left on the native mind, she made an exception in the case of Ai, and not long afterwards she was able to purchase her liberty for ten pounds, and she became an inmate of the mission house, Miss Lester's intention being to train her so that she might be useful to any lady who lived at the station during her absences in Scotland. To the natives, Ai was an outcast and had no character. Mary said to Mr. Ovens, If a slave dealer came round, I would not get six pounds for her. Why, said she, she has no character. But he would buy her and take her up country. What for? To feed her for chop. For some time she suffered physically from the shock she had received. No mother could have grieved more bitterly over the loss of a beloved child. My heart aches for my darling, she wrote. Oh, the empty place, and the silence, and the vain longing for the sweet voice, and the soft caress and the funny ways. Oh, Susie, Susie. Chapter 25 
Mary Kingsley's Visit Miss Kingsley paid her visit to the West Coast in 1893. Like all who traveled in West Africa, she heard of the woman missionary who lived alone among the wild Okuyang, and made a point of going up to see her. Miss Lesser welcomed so capable and earnest a worker. She gave me, says Miss Kingsley, some of the pleasantest days of my life. In some respects, these two brilliant women were much akin, although they were poles asunder in regard to their outlook on spiritual matters. They had long discussions on religious subjects and would sit up late, beating over such questions as the immortality of the soul. Miss Kingsley was profoundly impressed. I would give anything to possess your belief, she said wistfully, but I can't. I can't. When God made me, he must have left out the part that one believes with. Nevertheless, Mary said that for all her beliefs and unbeliefs, she was one of the most truly Christian women she had ever met. On her return to England, Miss Kingsley spoke often of her in terms of affection and admiration, and acknowledged to friends that she had done her much spiritual good. Mary, on her part, poured into her possession all her treasures of knowledge concerning the fetish ideas and practices of the natives, and probably none knew more about these matters than she. Most missionaries confess that they never get to the back of the people's minds, and one who worked in a neighboring field once said that after nineteen years' careful study, he had yet to master the intricacies of native superstition. The information that Mary supplied was therefore of great value, and much of it was utilized in Miss Kingsley's books. In Travels in West Africa, she gave the following considered view of the missionary. This very wonderful lady has been eighteen years in Calabar for the last six or seven years living entirely alone, as far as white people go, in a clearing in the forest near to one of the principal village of the Okoyang district, and ruling as a veritable white chief over the entire district. Her great abilities, both physical and intellectual, have given her among the tribe a unique position, and won her, from white and black who knew her, a profound esteem. Her knowledge of the native, his language, his ways of thought, his diseases, his difficulties, all that is his is extraordinary. And the amount of good she has done, no man can fully estimate. Oh Young, when she went there alone, living in the native houses for a while, she built, with the assistance of the natives, her present house, was a district regarded with fear by the Duke and Creek Town natives, and practically unknown to Europeans. It was given, as most of the surreal districts still are, to killing at funerals, ordeal by poison, and perpetual wars. Many of these evil customs she has stamped out, and Oh Young rarely gives trouble to its nominal rulers counselors in Old Calabar, and trade passes freely through it down to the seaports. This instance of what one white can do would give many important lessons in West Coast administration and development. Only the sort of man Mary Slessor represents is rare. There are but few who have the same power of resisting the malarial climate and of acquiring the language and an insight into the people's mind. So perhaps, after all, it is no great wonder that Miss Slessor stands alone, as she certainly does. With all her robust ability, Miss Kingsley's mental range was curiously narrow. She wrote strongly against Protestant missionary aims and methods in West Africa, her views being entirely opposed to those of the white woman of Okoyang, who had a much greater right to speak on the subject. But the latter nevertheless loved her, and when the news of her death came, some years later, she was plunged into grief. The world held not many so brave and so noble, she wrote. Life feels very cold and seems gray and sunless. Hearing of a proposed memorial to the intrepid traveller, she sent a guinea as her might towards it. Chapter 26 An All-Night Journey An outburst of fighting had taken place amongst the factions around Ekenge. Women were the cause of it, and a number had been herded into a stockade near the mission house, where a band of men were proceeding to murder them. Mary came on the scene and held them at bay. All day she stood there, and all night girls handing her from time to time a cup of tea through the poles of the enclosure. Next night, matters had become quieter, a tornado of rain and wind having eased the situation. But she was soaked, while the mats of the mission house had blown up and the interior had been flooded, so that both the girls and herself needed dry garments. Then the condensed milk was nearly gone, she was told, and the baby she was nursing would suffer without it. Both clothing and milk could only be procured from Calabar, and as she had no messenger to dispatch there, she resolved to go herself. After dark, she stole out of the stockade, placing the child in a basket, secured a woman as guide, and with lantern started out to walk through the bush to Creek Town. She reached Daibo on the Calabar River about half-past ten, 
obtained a cup of tea from the native pastor and pushed on. Her guide lost the way. A deluge of rain fell, and they wandered aimlessly for a time through the dripping forest, before again striking the track. Creektown was reached at four in the morning. She knocked up Miss Johnstone, who sent her to bed for an hour, and sought for some tins of milk. As soon as the two had been procured, Mary was eager to be off. Miss Johnstone gave her some changes of clothing, and King Eoy put his canoe and a strong crew at her disposal, and she was soon speeding up river. On her arrival she found to her satisfaction that her absence had not been discovered, and she was able eventually to restore peace without the shedding of blood. Two days later a canoe which came down river to Duketown brought word that she was ill with hysteria. Dr. Lawls of Livingstonia, who was then visiting the mission as a deputy, happened to be in Creektown and was asked to go and see her with Mr. Mason, one of the industrial staff as guide. Their canoe was nearly swamped by rain, and they had to change their clothes when they arrived. She was soon up and through to the hall to provide hospitality for her guest, supporting herself by the table the while. A peremptory order came from Dr. Laws to return to bed at once. She gave him a long, curious look, and then without a word went and lay down. He noticed that his companion appeared both astonished and amused, and it was not until he returned to Calabar and heard Mr. Mason telling how Ma Slesser had been taken in charge for once that he realized how bold he had been. Dr. Laws thought the few women, or even men, could have stood the isolation that she endured. Chapter 27. Ackham, A First Fruit Although force of circumstances made her the instrument of law and order, her chief aim was to win the people to Christ, and all her efforts were directed to that end. It was for souls she was always hungering, and the lack of conversations was her greatest sorrow. Nevertheless, she was making progress. The people were becoming familiar with the names of God and Christ and the principles underlying the gospel and there were many who lent more to the new way than to the old, while some in their hearts believed. The boys that were being trained at school and service were perhaps the most cheering element in the situation, and upon them she set her hopes. It was wonderful that she achieved what she did in view of the conditions that prevailed. How difficult it was for a native to break away from habits and customs, ingrained in them through centuries of repetition, may be gathered from the story of Acom, a free woman, one of the most self-righteous of the big ladies of the district. She had been betrothed, when a year old, to a young and powerful chief, and had been brought up in the harem, and was a zealous upholder of all superstitious practices. On her lord's death she escaped the poison ordeal, and was active in placing wives and slaves into the grave. By and by, Yikping Yang made her his wife and mistress of the harem, and for twenty years she held undisputed sway. When Edom's son was killed by the falling of a log, it will be remembered that Ikping Yang was blamed for the event and retired to the bush. Not long afterwards, a young chief there fell sick, and the witch doctor, on consulting his oracle, declared that he saw Ikum and her son dancing the whole night long, and gaily piercing the sick man with knives and spears. Ikum was charged with sorcery, and asked to take the poison ordeal. Her friends advised her to flee and she and her son disappeared during the night and took refuge in Uman, where the people gave them the protection of Ibritem, or Juju. Ma was in Scotland at the time. When she returned, Iping Yan begged her to interfere and have his wife brought back. This she managed to do after Akim had taken Imbiam, the strongest and most dreaded of native oaths, which included the drinking of blood shed from the wrist. The woman came to see her but stood outside. What? exclaimed Ma. You cannot come within my gate? No, was the reply. You had a twin mother, once living in the yard. I cannot come in lest I touch the place she touched. Those who took the Imbian oath believed that they would die if they came in contact in any way with the twin mother. Ma pretended to be hurt and said, If my house is polluted to you, you had better go home, as I do not receive visitors on the road. After a time, Ikim ventured in, and when she was kind to her and gave her an order for mats, in the making of which she was adept. She then came regularly and listened intently to Ma's teaching, although she said nothing. By and by she began to remark on the purity of the gospel religion, and show increased reverence at the services. Twins came, and she mastered her fear and went to the house. But alas, a mysterious pain straightway developed in her foot, and this surely was Imbian punishing her. And when a skin disease followed, her faith nearly failed her, and she wailed and mourned in despair. Ma spoke strongly to her, and at last she rose and said, I am a fool. 
my God, my Father, listen not to my foolishness. Kill me if thou wilt, but do not leave me. The disease was checked, and a native medicine effected a cure, but she stood out against any sacrifices, saying very sensibly, My father owns the bush, and gives us the knowledge of the medicine, and as the master knows what he has made, he knows how to bless it apart from any outsider. Ikpingyang all this while had ignored his wife, expecting that the Imbian would do its work. He looked grimly on, and when she injured her foot against a root, he believed the end had arrived. All the people watched the struggle between the white woman's prayers and the Indian's power, and when the wound healed, they quaintly explained the miracle by saying that their mother was different from other white people, and so had prevailed. Akim grew in grace despite her surroundings, and found strength in her contact with Christ. An amazing thing to her was that the man who had accused her of witchcraft came and made friends with her. Ma, she said, see what God has wrought. The man who demanded my life comes to tell me his affairs. I have sometimes wanted to take revenge, but I have got it from God, and his revenge is of a sweeter kind than that of the council. It was cases like this that colored Miss Lesser's life with joy. Sometimes, too, she was unexpectedly cheered by evidence of the fruit of her work in past days. In 1894, a lad, an old scholar of hers in Duketown, turned up in the village. He had made good use of his education, and wherever he went, on farm and on beach, he held worship and got the people to listen. It was not surprising that she regarded the boys as her most helpful agents, although she was always very careful in choosing them as teachers for bush schools. She thought it belittled the message to send those who were not thoroughly fit for the work. Chapter 28 The Box from Home The most joyous break in the domestic life at Ekenge, both for house, mother, and the children, was caused by the arrival of boxes of gifts from Scotland. So many congregations and Sunday schools had become interested in her and her work that there was a continuous stream of packages to Okoyang. I am ashamed at receiving so much, she would say. Her own friends also remembered her, and on one occasion she wrote to a lady who had sent a personal contribution. It seems like a box from a whole congregation, not from an individual. She was specifically delighted with the articles that came from the children of the church, and many letters she wrote in return to the scholars and Sunday schools. None knew better how to thank them. She would give them a picture of the landing of the boxes at Duketown, and the journey up the Calabar River in the canoe or in the steamer David Williamson, which they had themselves subscribed for and supplied to the beach, and of the excitement when the engineer came over, perhaps with visitors, to announce the arrival. White people come, ma! The cry by day or night always roused the household. One girl ran to make up the fire and put on the kettle. Another placed the spare room in order, a third took the hand parcels and wraps, and Ma herself welcomed the guests with a Scottish word or two and a warm hand clasp. They would give her home letters, but these she would lay aside until she was more at leisure. Then a whisper would go round that there were goods at the beach, and every man, woman, and child about the place would be eager to be off to bring them up. But the boxes would be too large and heavy to be borne on heads to the forest, and they would be opened and the contents taken up into packages, with which the carriers marched off in single file. Depositing them in the house, they would return for more, until all was safely conveyed. Then the articles would be exposed amidst cries of wonder and delight, and the house became like a bazaar. Sometimes there would be a mix-up of articles, but the loving messages, pinned on each, would clear up the confusion. Mary dearly loved to linger over each gift, and spin a little history into it, and she would pray with a full heart, Lord Jesus, thou knowest the giver, and the love, and the prayers, and the self-denial. Bless and accept and use it all for thy glory and for the good of these poor, strained, ignorant children, and repay all a thousandfold. She was careful in her allocation of the gifts amongst the people in order that they might not be regarded as a bribe to ensure good behavior or attendance at the services. She would not even give them as payments for work done as this, she thought, put the service on a commercial basis and made them look again for an equivalent gain. Pictures and texts, like dolls, were somewhat of a problem, as there was a danger of the people worshipping them but they liked to beautify their squalid huts with them, and she regarded them as a civilizing agent not to be despised. Also, to a certain extent, they gave an indication of those who had sympathy with the new ideas and were sometimes a silent confession of break with heathenism. To one old woman, the first Christian, was given a copy of The Light of the World. Holding it reverently, she exclaimed, Oh, I shall never be lonely any more. I cannot read the book, but I can sit or lie and look at my Lord, and we can speak together. Oh, my Savior, keep me till I see you yonder. It was explained that the picture was an allegory, and the woman understood, but she simply saw Christ in all the fervor of her newborn love and faith, and Mary trusted to keep her right by daily teaching. 
Some of the articles she found odd uses. A dress would be given to a girl who was entering into seclusion for fattening. A dressing gown would go to the chi, who was a member of the native court, and he would wear it when trying cases, to the admiration of the people. A white shirt would be presented to another chief, and he would don it like a stage rope when paying Ma a formal visit. Blouses she retained, since no native women wore them. The pretty baby clothes were a source of wonder to the people. They were speechless at the idea of babes wearing such priceless things. It must be confessed that there was something for which Ma always searched when a box from her own friends arrived. Like the children, she was fond of sweets, and there would be a shriek of delight from more than juvenile lips when the well-known tins and bottles were discovered in some corner where they had been designedly hidden.